The uh, topic for today is how to change variables. Uh, so, so we're talking about substitutions and differential equations or uh, changing variables. Uh, that might seem like a sort of fussy thing to talk about in the third or fourth lecture, but, but it isn't. The reason is that so far the you know how to solve two kinds of differential equations, two kinds of first order differential equations. The one where you can separate variables and the linear equation that we talked about last time. Now, the sad fact is that in some sense those are the only two general methods there are. That those are the only two kinds of equations that can always be solved. Uh, well, what about all the others? The answer is that to a great extent, all the other equations can be, that can be solved, the solution is done by changing the variables in the equation to reduce it to one of the cases that we can already do. Now, I'm going to give you two examples of that, two significant examples of that today. But ultimately, as you'll see, the way the equations are solved is by changing them into a linear equation or an equation where the variables are separable. However, that's for a few minutes. The first change of variables that I want to talk about is a, an, a, an almost trivial one, but it's the most common kind there is, and you've already had it in physics class. But I think it's so important in the science and engineering subjects that it's it's a good idea even in 1803 to call attention to it explicitly. So in that sense, the most common change of variables is the one simple one called scaling. So the, again, uh, the kind of equation I'm talking about is a general first order equation. And scaling simply means to change the coordinates, in effect to change the uh, axes, to change the coordinates on the axes, to scale the axes, to st either stretch them or contract them. So what does the change of variable actually look like? Well, it means you introduce new variables where x1 is equal to x times something or times a constant. I'll write it as divided by a constant uh, since that tends to be a little bit more the way people uh, think of it. Um, and uh, y the same. So the new variable y1 is related to the old one uh, by an equation of that form. So a, b, constants. So those, the, those are the uh, change of, those are the equations. Now why does one do this? Well, well there are a lot of reasons, but uh, maybe we could list them. Uh, you, uh, for example, could be changing uh, units. That's a common reason in physics. Uh, changing the units that are used, uh, you'd have to make a change of coordinates of this form. Uh, perhaps an even more important reason is to, uh, sometimes it's used to make the variables dimensionless. In other words, where the variable, so that the variables become pure numbers with no units attached to them. Uh, since you're well aware of the tortures involved in dealing with units in physics, uh, the point of making variables uh, dimension, I'm sorry, dimensionless, I don't have to sell that. Dimensionless, i.e., no units, without units without any units attached. It's just, it represents the number three, not three seconds or three grams or anything like that. And the third reason is to reduce or simplify the constants. Reduce the number or simplify the constants in the equation. Reduce their number is self-explanatory. Simplify means make them uh, less, either dimensionless also, or if you can't do that, at least less dependent upon the critical units than the old ones were. 
Let me give you a very simple example which will illustrate most of these things. Um, it's the uh, equation, it's a version of the cooling law which applies at very high temperatures and it runs, so it's like Newton's cooling laws except, uh, except it's the internal and external temperatures are, are very, what's important is not the first power as in Newton's law but the fourth power. So it's a constant and the difference is now it's the external temperature which just uh, so there won't be so many capital T's in the equation I'm going to call M to the fourth power minus T to the fourth power. So T is the internal temperature the thing we're interested in and M is the external constant which I'll assume uh, now is a constant external temperature. So this is for valid if a big temperature different for big temperature uh, differences Newton's law breaks down and, and one needs a different one. Now you're free to solve that equation just as it stands if you can. Uh, there are difficulties connected with it because you're dealing with fourth powers of course. Uh, but before you do that one should scale. How shall I scale? Well, I'm going to scale by relating, in, relating T to M. So the new variable I'm going to use is T1 equals T divided by M. This is now dimensionless because M of course has the units of temperature, degrees Celsius, degrees absolute, whatever it is, uh, as does T and therefore by taking the ratio of the two it now becomes, there are no units attached to it. So, um, so this is dimensionless. Uh, now how actually do I change the variable in the equation? Uh, watch this, it's, it's an utterly trivial idea and utterly important. Uh, don't slog around doing it this way, trying to stuff it in and divide first. Instead, do the inverse. In other words, write it instead as T equals MT1. Uh, the reason being that it's T that's facing you in that equation and therefore T that you want to substitute for. So let's do it. The new equation will be what? Well, DT, since this is a constant, the left hand side becomes DT1 DT times M equals K times M to the fourth minus M to the fourth T1 to the fourth. So I'm going to factor out that M to the fourth and make it one minus T1 to the fourth, okay? Now I can divide through by M and get rid of one of those and so the new equation now is DT1 DT, the time uh, is equal to, now I have K M cubed out front here. I'm going to just give that a new name K1. Essentially it's the same equation. It's no harder to solve nor uh, and no easier to solve than the original one. But it's been simplified slightly. For one thing it looks better. It looks better. Let's, uh, so I, to compare the two I'll put this one up in green and this one in green too just to s convince you it's the same, indicate that it's the same equation. Notice, so T1 has been rendered, is now dimensionless, so I don't have to even ask when I solve this equation, oh please tell me what the units of temperature are, what kind of, how are you measuring temperature, it makes no difference to this equation. K1 still has units, what units does it have? Uh, it, it's been simplified because it now has the units of, uh, uh, since this is dimensionless and this is dimensionless, it has the units of inverse time. So K1, whereas it had units involving both degrees and seconds before, now it's inverse time as its units. And moreover, uh, there's one less constant, so one less constant in the equation. 
It just looks better, in short. Uh, this business, uh, I think you know that K1, the process of forming K1 out of K1 out of uh, Km cubed is called lumping constants. Uh, I think they use that standard terminology in physics and in engineering courses. You try to get all the constants together like this, and then you make it, you lump them. They, they are lumped for you, and then you just give the lump a new name. So that's an example of scaling. Uh, watch out for when you can use it. For example, it would have uh, probably been a good thing to use on, uh, in the first problem set when you were handling this problem of uh, drug elimination and hormone elimination and production inside of the thing. Uh, you could lump constants in, as was done to some extent on the solutions, to uh, get a neater looking answer, one without so many constants in it. Okay, now let's uh, now go to serious stuff where we're actually going to make changes of variables which we hope will render unsolvable equations suddenly solvable. Now, I'm going to make, do that by making substitutions, but it's, I think, quite important to watch out that there are two kinds of substitutions. There are direct substitutions. Uh, that's where you introduce a new variable. I, I don't know how to write this on the board. I'll just write it schematically. So the new, it's, it's one which says that the new variable is equal to some combination of the old variables. The other kind of substitution is inverse. It's just the reverse. Here you say that the old variables are some combination of the new. Now, often you'll have to stick in a few old variables too. But the basic, it, it's what appears on the left-hand side. Are you, is it a new variable that appears on the left-hand side by itself, or is it the old variable that appears on the left-hand side? Now, right here, we have an example. The, if I did it as a direct substitution, I would have written T1 equals T over M. That's the way I define the new variable, which, of course, you have to do if you're introducing it. But when I actually did the substitution, I did the inverse substitution. Namely, I used t equals t1, uh, m times t1. And the reason for doing that was because it was the capital T's that faced me in the equation, and I had to have something to replace them with. Now, you've seen this already in calculus, uh, this, this distinction, uh, but that might have been a year and a half ago. Uh, just let me remind you, uh, typically in calculus, for example, when you want to do this kind of integral, let's say x times the square root of 1 minus x squared dx, the substitution you would use for that is u equals 1 minus x squared, right? and then you'd calculate, and then you'd observe that this, the x dx moral x makes up du apart from a constant factor. So this would be an example of direct substitution. You would put it in and convert the integral into an integral in u. What would be an example of inverse substitution? Well, if I take away the x and ask you instead to do this integral, then you know that the right thing to do is not to start with u, but to start with the x and write x equals sine or cosine u. So this is a direct substitution in that integral, but this integral calls for an inverse substitution in order to be able to do it. And notice they look practically the same, but of course, as you know from your experience, they're not. They're very different. Okay, so I'm going to watch for that distinction as I do uh, these examples. The first one I want to do is an example of a direct substitution. So it applies to an equation of the form y prime equals there are two term, kinds of terms on the right-hand side. A of x, some, uh, let's use P of x. P of x 
times y plus q of x times any power whatsoever of y. Well, notice, for example, if n were 0, what kind of equation would this be? y to the n would be 1. And this would be a linear equation, which you know how to solve. So n equals 0, we already know how to do. So let's assume that n is not 0, so that we're in new territory. Well, uh, if n were equal to 1, you could separate variables. So that, too, is not exciting. But nonetheless, it will be included in what I'm going to say now. If n is 2 or 3 or n could be 1 half, so n anything. Even 0 is all right. It's just silly. Any number. Could be negative. n equals minus 5. That would be fine also. Uh, this kind of equation, to give it its name, is called the Bernoulli equation. After, named after which Bernoulli, I have not the faintest idea. Uh, there were, f I think, three or four of them. And they fought with each other, but they were all smart. Now, uh, the key trick, if you like, method to solving any Bernoulli equation, uh, let me call one other thing I should call that. It, most important is what's missing. It must not have a pure x term in it. If I, it and that goes for a constant term, either. In other words, it must look exactly like this. Everything multiplied by y or a power of y, two terms. So for example, if I add 1 to this, the equation becomes non-doable. Right? It's very easy to contaminate it into an equation that's unsolvable. It's got to look just like that. Now you got one on your homework. So uh, you got several. Both part 1 and part 2 have Bernoulli equations on them. So you know this, this is practical uh, in some sense. What do we got? The idea is uh, to divide by, divide by y to the n. Ignore all formulas that you're given. Just remember that when you see something that looks like this, or something that you can turn into something that looks like this, divide through by y to the nth power, no matter what n is. All right, so y prime over y to the n is equal to p of x times um, 1 over y to the n minus 1, right? Plus q of x. Well, that certainly doesn't look any better than what I started with. And in your terms, it probably looks somewhat worse because it's got all those y's of the denominator. And who wants to see them there? But look at it. In, in this very slightly transformed Bernoulli equation is a linear equation struggling to be free. Where is it? Why is it trying to be a linear equation? Make a new variable. Call this hunk of it a new variable. Let's call it v. So v is equal to 1 over y to the n minus 1. Or if you like, you can think of that as y to the 1 minus n. What's v prime? So this is the direct substitution I'm going to use. Uh, but the course, the problem is, what am I going to use on this? Well, the miracle, little miracle happens. What's the derivative of this? It is 1 minus n times y to the negative n times y prime. In other words, up to a constant, this constant factor 1 minus n, it's exactly the left-hand side of the equation. Well, let's make n not equal 1 either. As I said, you can separate variables if, if n equals 1. What's the equation then turned into? Our Bernoulli equation divided through in this way is then turned into the equation 1 minus n, uh, sorry, v prime divided by 1 minus n is equal to p of x times v plus q of x. It's linear. And now, 
solve it as a linear equation. Solve it as a linear equation. You notice it's not in standard form, not in standard linear form. To do that, you're going to have to put the p on the other side. That's OK, that term on the other side. Solve it. And at the end, don't forget that you put in the v. It wasn't in the original problem. So you have to convert the problem back, the answer, back in terms of y. It'll come out in terms of v but you must put it back in terms of y. Let's do a really simple example just to illustrate the method and to illustrate the fact that I don't want you to uh, uh, memorize formulas. Learn methods, not final formulas. So, uh, so suppose the equation is, uh, let's say, um, y prime equals y over x. minus y squared. Uh, that's a Bernoulli equation. Uh, I could, of course, have concealed it by writing xy prime plus xy prime minus xy equals negative y squared. Then it wouldn't look instantly like a Bernoulli equation. You'd have to stare at it a while and say, hey, that's a Bernoulli equation. Uh, OK, but so I'm handing it to you on a silver platter, as it were. So what do we do? Divide through by y squared, so it's y prime over y squared equals uh, 1 over x times 1 over y minus 1. And now uh, the substitution that I'm going to make is for this thing, v equals 1 over y. It's a direct substitution v prime is going to be negative 1 over y squared times y prime. Don't forget to use the chain rule when you differentiate with respect, because the differentiation is with respect to x, of course, not with respect to y. OK, so what's this thing? That's the left-hand side. The only thing, it's, it's got a negative sign. So this is minus v prime equals 1 over x is, stays 1 over x, 1 over y. So it's v over x minus 1. So let's put that in standard form. Uh, in standard form, it will look like, first imagine multiplying it through by negative 1 and then putting this term on the other side. And it will turn into v prime plus v over x is equal to uh, 1. So that's the linear equation in standard linear form that we're asked to solve. And the solution isn't very hard. The integrating factor is, well, I integrate 1 over x. That makes log x. And e to the log x, so is e to the log x, which is, of course, just x itself. So I should multiply this through by x to be able to integrate it. Now, some of you, I would hope, just can see that uh, right away, that it, if you multiply this through by x, it's going to look good. So after we do multiply through by x, what do I get? x, v, prime for the, uh, maybe I shouldn't skip a step. Uh, you're, you're still learning this stuff, so let, let's not skip a step. So it becomes xv prime plus v equals x, OK? After I multiplied through by the integrating factor, this now says x, this is xv prime, and I quickly check that that, in fact, is what it's equal to, equals x. And therefore, uh, xv is equal to 1 half x squared plus a constant. And therefore, v is equal to 1 half x plus c over x. You can leave it in that form, or you can combine terms. It doesn't matter much. Uh, am I done? The answer is no, I am not done because nobody reading this answer would know what v was. v wasn't in the original problem. It was y that was in the original problem. And therefore, I have to, the relation is one is the reciprocal of the other. And therefore, I have to turn this expression upside down. Well, if you're going to have to turn it upside down, you probably should make it look a little better. Let's rewrite it as x squared plus 2c, combining fractions, I think they call it in high school or elementary school, uh, plus 2c. How's that? x squared 
plus 2c divided by 2x. Now 2c, you don't call a constant 2c because it's, it's just as arbitrary to call it c1. So I'll call that, so this